were as blessed by this as I was in preparing it today. And so let me read to you our lesson from the Gospel of Mark, the 10th chapter. Jesus started on his way, and Jesus was starting on his way, and a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him and said, Good teacher, he said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus said. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, the man said, all these things I've kept since I was a boy. But Jesus looked on him and loved him and said, one thing you still lack. Go, sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor. You will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. So at this, the man's face fell, for he went away sad, because he had great wealth. But Jesus then looked to his disciples and said to them, How hard it is for a rich person to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at these words, but Jesus again said to them, Children, how hard it is for a person to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more perplexed and amazed. They said, who then could ever be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with humans it's impossible, but with God all things are possible. So Peter spoke up, but Lord, we've given everything up to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, no one who has left our brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or fields for me or for the gospel's sake, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, along with persecutions, but in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. The gospel of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. We are so grateful, O oh God, for your presence today, and pray that you bless the lesson that we hear, that it might inspire us, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we prepare to hear the lesson for today, if this is your first time hearing me in the last couple of weeks preach, I want to make sure you understand that it is really impossible to take uh, the context or the scripture lessons that we read out of the context or to at least understand it if you remove it from the context. So you need to understand what has been taking place over the course of the last few weeks or the last few chapters before this chapter because otherwise this lesson directed at the rich man and Jesus' disciples about wealth doesn't make any sense. It's easy to take this out of context and come to a wrong meaning and a wrong understanding of that. So you need to understand that this is spoken within the context of four previous lessons where Jesus was addressing how scandalous the kingdom of heaven would be for those of us who have a wrong and differing understanding. In particular, the Jewish leadership of their day were preaching a wrong message about the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus was trying to correct his disciples and all of his followers about what the kingdom was, and it was quite scandalous. So one lesson a couple of weeks ago, we heard about how the leaders of the kingdom of heaven movement, or the leader of the kingdom of heaven movement, also known as who? That's right, Jesus, came to die. That didn't sit well with the disciples, especially with Peter, who said, Jesus, you're not going to die, but Jesus said, it is necessary in order for God's work to be done. So they didn't understand that the leader, who was supposed to be a military leader and a powerful leader, was going to die before the kingdom of heaven would uh, take place and come to fruition. The, the second thing, the servants, not the leaders, are the true heroes of the kingdom of God. Uh, that was a couple of weeks ago. Then the third thing that we learned about the kingdom is a scandalous thing, is that leaders must never use their power to impose their will upon other people because leaders in the kingdom never use their position to force their way upon other people. The fourth thing that they learn, children, not mainly men, not men who can swing a sword, not people who have lots of wealth that contribute to the kingdom of heaven, or somehow value in that manner, or some tangible manner, those folks are not the true representatives of the kingdom of heaven, but children are the true representatives of the kingdom of heaven. People who have nothing to contribute, who in no way can earn their keep, they are the ones that understand what the kingdom of heaven is about. And that's what we looked about last week. And so it is within that context, we have this day's lesson about the rich man who came to Jesus and wanted to know what he had to do in order to be saved. 
But today, Jesus uses this as an experience to, re, again, redefine what the kingdom of heaven would be about. And he says something that is really baffling to the disciples and those who are listening. Rich people have no shot of getting themselves into heaven. And I want you to hear what I said again, because the word choice that I used is very intentional. It is, it is rich people... It is impossible for a rich person to get themselves into heaven. Now, notice I didn't say rich people will not go to heaven. Notice that I didn't say rich people can't go to heaven. Notice what I did say. It is impossible for a rich person to get themselves into the kingdom of God and into heaven. That is very intentional, that word themselves. And we'll come back to the minute because that's exactly the point that Jesus was trying to make. It is impossible for anybody to get themselves into the kingdom of God. So again, we draw this picture, rich man. Notice it doesn't say in our lesson today, rich young ruler. That's another gospel account that says that. It's probably the same story, the same guy. So we can apply from that, it might be that rich young guy, that rich young ruler. But we know that he's wealthy and that he's uh, come to Jesus. And he wants to know that what he, what he must do to be saved because, you know, this rich man knew that something was lacking in his spiritual inventory, and he just couldn't put his finger on it. He didn't know how to get there. And so, see, from his perspective, he'd followed all the commandments and all the laws of God, but something was missing, and he wasn't sure what it was, and so he came to Jesus to show him so that he might earn his keep and get to heaven. <clears throat> so, whatever it was, was kind of out of his mind. He's like, oh, I know it's there somewhere. What am I forgetting? Have you ever done that? where you know you, you, you're trying to think of something, you know you've forgotten something, you're trying to remember what it was, and you just can't place it. This actually happened to me a month ago. I'm sitting, confessing this right now in front of my wife. Uh, this is, uh, we had a busy day. I had a really busy day about uh, a month ago or so, and I had to get my daughter to work. She had to go to the zoo. And I had all these things I had to do while she was at the zoo. I had to go to the hospital. I had to do this. I had to do that. So it was going to be several hours before I got back to the house. And so I'm running, grabbing everything, making sure I have everything. I run to the car. I jump in the car, start the engine. And I just nag a feeling something is missing. And I'm not sure what it is. And I pull up to the stop sign. I turn left. I get to the second stop sign. And all of a sudden it dawns on me what I forgot. Yes, I forgot Carissa, my daughter. It is a true story. And I'm like, holy flipping cow. Well, that would have been really embarrassing to get to the zoo and say, crap. Uh, then i got to go all the way back home and pick her up. So I pull around again. Now, Chris is kind of standing there on the, uh, on the front porch. She doesn't know any better. She's like, what? I'm just like, oh, I just, whatever. I, I don't know what I told her. I pulled up. I opened the, she opened the car door. I acted like I was cool, and I meant to do that. But I didn't. Have you ever had a day like that? Or something you couldn't put your finger on? You knew you forgot it. That's what this rich man, young ruler, was doing. He was like, what did I forget? What am I forgetting? And so Jesus kind of tells him. See, the problem with the rich young ruler, he has this idea that salvation is a mechanical process. What do I mean by that? You have a quarter, you go up to a gumball machine, you stick that quarter in the gumball machine slot, you turn the, the handle, and what happens? Out comes, most of the time, a piece of gum. That's a mechanical process. You put in your quarter, you turn the handle, out comes the gumball. That was what he thought happened with the kingdom of heaven. You do this, 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 and this, you put in your thing, you do what you're supposed to do, out comes the reward of the kingdom of heaven. He believed it was a mechanical process by which he could earn his salvation. And I hate to say a lot of us Christians still have this view to this day. His vision of being a, per, uh, a good person was very limited. It was simply just fulfilling a list of minimum requirements. You know, we have in our Constitution of our congregation a rule that specifies what a person must do to be considered an active member and honestly I think it's a joke 
Because I'm going to tell you what it is. For those of you who have been on our church council and board and so forth, you know what the rule says. The rule says that anybody who contributes an offering of record or communes at least once per year is considered to be an active member. That isn't very much, is it? So you literally could come into worship service and put a penny in the offering plate. Now you're an active member, right? But yet there are people who are there every single Sunday. Now let me tell you how this rule is abused. In many of our congregations throughout the country of the same constitution, there have been conflicts that have taken place where uh, two or three people really want to get something pushed through the congregation, but nobody else in the congregation wants it. And so what do they do? They go to all of their friends, and they go to all of their family that have been in that church in 20, 30 years, and they get them all to pack the pew one Sunday and to give a penny in the offering plate, and now they're considered members, and they go and derail the entire congregation. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard this story happen. It is wrong and it is evil as far as I'm concerned. Because those folks are doing the bare minimum. Guess what happens once they get what they want? They all disappear because they're not invested or committed to the real life of the congregation. That's the problem with this young or this rich man. He wasn't really invested in the kingdom of heaven. He wanted to put his penny in the offering plate and get his reward. He wanted to do the bare minimum so he could get to heaven. He was limiting what he was willing to do. The true disciple of Christ never limits or puts a limit on what they are called by God to do. So take a look what Jesus says to him. His response is quite shocking. Jesus looks at the rich man and says, there's one thing you still lack. And the rich man, you got to imagine, he kind of lights up at this point and says, I'm going to know what it is that i got to do. That one thing I'm forgetting, that one thing I forgot. Jesus looks at him and says, you must sell all your possessions, give everything away to the poor. That's what you're missing. We are told basically that this rich man's jaw dropped. And he was very discouraged. And he hung his head. And he walked home because his wealth was great. I caution you with this lesson. Here's my caution. It is not in the selling of this man's goods that would earn him salvation. That's a misunderstanding of what Jesus is trying to tell the man. What this man came to Jesus for was to find out what he was lacking in his spiritual inventory. And Jesus saw through it very clearly and very quickly. Jesus identified the source of the man's emptiness in his life. And what he realized is that the rich, man's, rich man was Lacking trust in God. He was depending upon his wealth, his position, his power, his abilities to earn him salvation, and he was lacking a trust in God. So what Jesus identified in him was that he needed to rid himself of that illusion that he was somehow in charge of his own salvation dream. That's something that God does for us. So my warning with this is simply this. For those who want to take this lesson and say that every rich person needs to sell all their possessions because, see, Jesus said it. That's not what this passage says. This passage is referring to this rich man. Don't you dare take this as something that Jesus is telling every rich person to do. Now, it may be the lack in many rich people's lives. May, there may be other rich people who probably these words would be very good for because they're trusting in their wealth and they depend upon that. But not all rich people do, and I do not believe that this is Jesus' word to every rich people. I want to tell you a story about a very wealthy couple. A couple that I knew that was related to me in fact, they had a bankroll. Are you ready for this? Everybody's jaws ready to drop. They had a bankroll of $50 million. They're related to me. How? My brother's in-laws. They were very wealthy. Well, 
They had made a nice living. It came time to retire. And uh, they were having a nice retirement. Everything was good. I mean, they had several homes. I think they had three homes. They had one in Arizona, one in Florida. They had one, you know, where they lived in, in Colorado. Just a great life. Everything was good. Uh, you remember several years back, what was his name? Uh, 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 the guy in New York who basically swindled everybody out of their money in the investments. What was his name? Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff. Yeah, they got themselves aligned with one of them. And that man took every dime of their money. They went from very wealthy to nothing like that. So here they are at the age of 80, and I'm telling you, they both right now are working at Walmart to make ends meet. And do you want to know what their response was? I'm sure they cried tears. I'm sure they were upset. But I've talked to them, and here's their response. It's just money. We've just got to do what everybody else has got to do to make ends meet. That's a godly, wealthy person. Am I right? What an attitude. They certainly did not have to give away all of their wealth in order to have a deeper relationship with God because their wealth was not a problem in their relationship with God. I know for a fact that they used their wealth to bless many people while they had it. They are good people. So again, I'm encouraging you not, and I'm warning you not to use this as an application for every wealthy person Jesus isn't asking that. He's only asking to this rich young man because this was his stumbling block before God. Let's go to number two under the shocking response to the rich man. The rich man was not prepared for the response that Jesus gave. And in fact, uh, <laughs> in fact, he left off kind of, he left Jesus worse than he came. He came to Jesus with an expectation and a hope that he would finally find that one thing that was missing in his inventory that would bring him to that perfection and that relationship with God that he so desired. And he left in great despair because he was not willing to pay the price to receive that. Money was that stumbling block in his life that prevented him from receiving that deeper relationship with God because it was an illusion that somehow he had a very deep relationship with God. You have to understand, and that day the Jews believed that if you were wealthy, it was a sign of God's blessing on your life. We know for a fact that just because you're rich doesn't mean that God is blessing you. Sometimes it means you're dishonest. Sometimes it just means you're working hard. Sometimes it's a sign of God's blessing. I, I, I caution us in interpreting it in the way the Jews did. It wasn't necessarily a sign of God's blessing. And that's what Jesus was trying to tell the disciples and those who were listening. That said, I want to I also tell you, there's no reason to despair for this rich man. Notice how, what Jesus responds is to Jesus. Do you notice there's a word that's used to Jesus when he looks at this rich man? How did he respond to them? him? Did you hear it when I read the lesson? It said that he looked at him with a great deal of love. He knew what this rich man needed. He probably also knew that this rich man wasn't ready to receive it. But guess what Jesus did? This is so Jesus, and this is so cool. Jesus planted a seed of faith in this rich man's life. See, the rich man, we have an advantage that the rich man didn't. The rich man is on the wrong side of the resurrection at the point of this story. But I happen to believe that once Jesus was resurrected, that I bet you that seed sprouted forth into something amazing. And God transformed his life. Don't know that to be true, but I believe that that's just in the nature of God. Don't you? That's how God is. So I think there's a lot of hope for the rich man in the story. I have a great deal of confidence that I'm going to get to heaven. And there's going to be this, well, the guy who was the rich guy. I don't know what his name is. Jael or something. I just made that one up. I have no clue. Does it Jael. Give a name? Huh? Does it, give a name? it doesn't give a name. I just made it up. I don't know. There's no name. Jael. Rich guy. Jael. All right. So Jael is going to come and greet us and say, hey, I'm Jael. Or at least the guy you called Jael in that sermon. I'm not going to remember that. He's going to say, I did make it because God 
brought me here. Isn't God grand? That's what he's going to say, and I just believe that to be true. Look at number three. What does this mean to us? This is the shocking revelation of today's lesson for us, and that is that money is not an indication of God's blessing. Money can't buy us heaven, but here's the thing. Neither can selling all our possessions get us heaven, into heaven either. So again, it goes both ways. You don't earn righteousness by selling all of your possessions and giving away. If you're expecting by giving money in the offering plate, you're going to gain some special advantage from God. It isn't going to happen. In fact, I will tell you, there's only one reason to put money in our offering plate today. You know what it is? It's not to support the budget of the church. It's not to pay for my salary, though I'm grateful for that when you do, okay? There's one reason to put money in the offering plate, because you are grateful for what God has done for you. The only reason. If you're putting money in there, in fact, uh, you know, we had, we had a member of our church one time who, uh, who said to me, ah, oh, I know I need to start putting money in the plate, but man, I just really don't want to. And I looked at him and I said, then don't. He said, what? Don't. It doesn't do you any good if you're putting it in there with that attitude. Don't put any money in it. We don't need your money. When you are prepared to put it in there because you're grateful, that's when you put money in the offering plate. It is out of gratitude. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us today. We need to realize, let it be under number three, our activity is not going to tr contribute in any manner to our salvation. The number of services that you come to in your lifetime, the amount of money that you give away, what you do for God's name, none of that is going to earn you anything special in the kingdom of heaven. Nothing. Okay? You've got to do it for one reason, because you are grateful. The problem with the rich man is that he did not come to Jesus Christ with a childlike faith. And so it is no accident. Remember, last week's lesson was about how children were the representatives of the kingdom of heaven. It is no accident that this story follows immediately after Jesus says to his disciples that if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you must be like this child. And then we have this very visible illustration of a rich man who is not coming with a childlike faith. He's depending upon his own hard work to get to heaven, okay? And so the rich man was not childlike in his faith. He could not trust that God would love him, and it was not his own actions that would bring him salvation. Then his disciples, remember I told you the Jews, some of many Jews, not all Jews, but many Jews had this idea that rich, being rich was a sign of God's blessing, and so the the uh, disciples of Jesus look at Jesus and their jaws kind of drop at this point and said, Jesus, if a rich dude can't get to heaven, how are we going to get to heaven? How's anybody? And Jesus says, with anybody, it is impossible. But with God, it is all things are possible. Again, it is God who does it. And then he says that you, disciples, who've given up all of your possessions, there's nothing you give, have given up that you won't be receive a hundredfold what you've given up. Now this again is not a mechanical thing. It's not like, oh, I'm going to give up a hundred bucks and a uh, hundredfold of that is what, ten thousand? Ten thousand dollars. Oh, I'm going to give a hundred dollars and Jesus has promised me I'm going to get ten thousand dollars out of that. You're a, you're a putz, okay? <laughs> That's not how this works. It's not a mechanical thing and you're thinking too much about financial blessings. You're stuck in the same rut of this rich man. If you're looking at it, oh, I'll give a hundred bucks, I'll give 10,000 bucks back. No, Jesus is saying whatever we give, don't look at it as a sacrifice. Why? Because God is just going to continue to bless you and bless you and bless you. You can never, ever outgive God, and that's what Jesus is trying to say. So go ahead, give everything away. God is still going to give you a hundred times more than you could ever possibly give away. That's what he's trying to tell his disciples. So don't fret, disciples. I'm here for you. I'm going to bless you. So what this means, Jesus says his disciples who gave up everything to follow him will be blessed a hundredfold. Again, it's not a mechanical blessing. We don't give up in order to receive. The view that our sacrifice earns us a blessing would be no better than, a man trying to, than this rich man trying to accomplish the very same thing. 
So again, if you're in a church that is teaching you that if you give some money, you're going to get richly blessed a hundredfold, and God's going to multiply that a hundred times, that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is already saying, you've received so many blessings, you can give everything away, but you'll never outgive God. The blessings of God will always, a hundred times, a hundredfold, outnumber anything that you could ever give up. So what does this mean for us? Number two, as inheritors of the kingdom of God, we are recipients of, a, of far more than we can ever give because after all, the kingdom of God is a gift of God that is not earned. Isn't an eternity a whole heck of a lot more than everything that we could ever possibly give away in this life, including our own lives? Jesus again reiterates that the servant, not the leader, has primacy in the kingdom of heaven and Jesus' economy, and he acknowledges that the gifts that God gives far exceed what we could ever, ever, ever give up. So what I'm going to ask you to do today, and I think this is what's important. One of the things I've noticed by people who've come to church their entire life, 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, many of them are still holding on to this baggage that somehow their activity of coming to church every Sunday of volunteering in the church, of putting their offering in the offering plate, is going to keep them from going to hell and get them a place in heaven. I'm asking us to release that burden. You're carrying a burden that you do not have to carry. Because none of the things that you've done, going to, going to church every Sunday, putting offering in the offering plate, volunteering for the church and doing the things you've done, not one of those things will earn you salvation. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to worship, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't put offering in the offering plate, I'm not saying that you shouldn't volunteer, okay? But we need to transform our attitude. We need to trust that our salvation is dependent upon God. And so I give those things, why? Out of gratitude for all that God has done. Yesterday, finished with this story. I was doing a premarital counseling with a couple that came here. Um, girl actually grew up in this church, and she wants me to do her wedding. And, and she, she brought her husband, and uh, he grew up in a different denomination. And I was explaining this very same thing about worship and about who God is and so forth, and how the only motivation to go to church should be gratitude. You should be here in church on Sunday for one reason because you want to say thank you for everything that God has done for you. You should come and put an offering in the offering plate because you just want to say thank you, God, for everything you've done. You should want to volunteer and give yourself away because one reason, because you're grateful and you want to say thank you. And so I was talking about this and I said, you know, fear should not be in the vocabulary of the Christian. You shouldn't be afraid that you're going to go to hell. You shouldn't be motivated by fear to do things for God's name. I said, that has no place in the church of God. It should only be one word, gratitude. And I will tell you, the young man that was with the girl, his eyes literally lit up and his big smile went on his face. I said, what's that from? He said, I've been to church all my life and I've never heard that. My church always used fear as a motivation, as a tactic to get us to do things. He said, I've never heard somebody say that. I said, well, now you have. Don't ever go to church because you're afraid. Don't ever put an offering because you're afraid or you're afraid of hell. Don't ever do something because you're afraid. Do it because you're grateful. Because I want to leave you with this. God adores every single one of you. That's our motivation. Because my Father loves me very much. Okay? Acquaintance of mine, Brennan Manning, I know I said that was my last story, but i got to finish with this because I love this. Yes, I opened it up for that. He's an acquaintance. Brennan Manning is a relatively well-known speaker. I had the privilege of meeting him. I ate with him a couple of times. Nice guy. But he was talking about a story about going to Scotland to visit with his father. Or no, his great uncle. I can't remember who it was. A relative. Uncle. I think it was his uncle. His uncle was nine years of age. His uncle wanted to go up on top of this big hill. He said his uncle was walking up like this, barely getting up this hill. And he's like, we could drive up the hill. But his uncle was just adamant about getting all the way up to the top of the hill. This is early in the morning, like 4.35 o'clock. And he's like, 
this guy is daft, he's crazy. It was his, his, his uncle's 90th birthday, I think it was, and that's why he was in Scotland to visit with him. And his uncle sat down on the hill, at the top of the hill, and waited. And the sun rose, and they sat, and they watched there. He said they were just completely quiet for hours, just watching the sunrise. And then he said his, his uncle got up, stood up, and then he started jumping and running down the hill. This nine-year-old, he's like, this guy is daft. What's wrong with him? And he runs up. He says, I'm having a hard time. I'm running up. I catch up. And he said, what's wrong with you? You've gone crazy. Oh, his uncle says, he stops he's out of breath. He says, what are you doing? He says, oh, I just realized something wonderful. He said, Bernard says, what, what? He says, me father loves me so dearly. Me father loves me very much. Isn't that beautiful? I want you to leave today knowing that your father loves you very much. Put away all of those burdens, all those things that have kept you down, all those negative messages, all that fear that people have driven into you. And I want you to leave that burden behind you. Because God is not a God of fear. Do you see the love that God has even for that rich young man? He wants you just to be like a child and trust him. Because your Father, oh, your Father loves you very much. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that you love us so much. And I know right now, there, hopefully, I, I think, I just have this feeling, this day, there's somebody who's listening, who's gone to church as a mechanical process because they think they have to, to get to heaven. They've thrown their offering in the offering plate because they have to, or else they're in trouble, because their church tells them to. Or they volunteer and try to do good things because they have to, otherwise they're not going to heaven. That's a bunch of hogwash. You just love them and adore them. And so I am praying that you would transform their lives so they would understand how much you just adore and love them. Yes, God, we want to respond in gratitude. We do give of ourselves, but for only one reason, to say thank you, that you love us enough that you would stoop down and crash into our existence, give us the gift of Jesus, and call us inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. All these things we give thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.